Hello ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope you can hear me and I'm not getting distorted. I hope you won't all fall asleep <laughs> for this, but um, in fact you're, the young, you're apparently all members of the National Trust. You're about the youngest group of members of the National Trust I think I've ever seen, but anyway, never mind. Anyway, um, we're starting off, believe it or not, on the Birmingham Canal since we're in Birmingham. Um, just a little bit of history to start with, and then I'll be pointing things out as we go along. Um, the, uh, the, boat, the, um, the canal was built between 1769 and 1771, and extended from, all the way from Birmingham to Wolverhampton, um, or the other side of Wolverhampton, actually, to, um, to link with the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal. And the Staffs and Worcester Canal linked with the Trent and Mersey Canal and with the River Severn. And so as a result of which, Birmingham then had a connection with the main rivers and therefore the sea and um, therefore exports and imports could be brought in much more easily. So that was the reason really for building the Birmingham Canal. Um, but the Birmingham Canal became very, very popular, very, very profitable and as a result of which, um, they had to do quite a lot of modifications, and we'll see those as we get to them. And what we're going to do to start with is go through this uh, bridge here, which is known as Broad Street Tunnel. Um, it doesn't, it's a bridge rather than a tunnel, but for a long time, it's extended the way we've just come. So in actual fact, our I'll point that out. Um, I'll point that out uh, when we actually come back. Now, what we're going to do when we get um, into the basin here, we shall turn round. That'll take us about five minutes or so, and so it'll give you time to have a look at the buildings on either side. Right, we're beginning to swing left here. Uh, all the buildings on the right um, are original, as you can see. Um, some of the buildings on this side are original, but all the ones straight ahead, which we're not going to go past, are all obviously new build or relatively new build, um, including the Canal House pub. Uh, which looks old, but isn't. It's a complete um, pastiche, really. But nevertheless, it, it, it looks right with the, the general age of the buildings. Right ahead of us, you can see a false archway. And that you used to go under Bridge Street. It's all bricked up now. Um, and run, would go all the way up to Paradise Street. I don't know where you're all from Birmingham, uh, whether you know where Paradise Street is, but virtually up to the town hall. But that was closed, those basins were closed in the mid-1930s, and from then onwards, this is as far as you can go, at least is that where the bridge is there. So, we're now having to do this rather complicated way of turning round. You can't turn a narrow boat like this on a sixpence, so it's going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to get round. Um, on the left here, you'll see a bridge, and there are one or two that we shall see. Um, a lot of them have been uh, pulled down, you know, because they're no longer used. But the bridges used to carry the towpath over arms, which connected with various factories. So you've got, um, in this particular case, and you can see the chimney there, there's only the wall left, which says Regency Wharf on it now, which is a bit of a construct. 
Um, but in fact, that was a glass factory, Pearson Cutlers. And amongst other things, they, they made the glass for Birmingham Cathedral, the beautiful Burne Jones um, stainless uh, um, stained glass windows, which uh, I don't know where you've been into Birmingham Cathedral, but they're well worth looking at. All part of the arts and crafts movement, really, basically, the style. Right, we're swinging round now. You see the little channel just down there where there's that railing? Well, that's known as the bar lock. Well, there isn't a lock there now, although you can see the recesses for the gates. There wasn't very much of a difference between this canal and the other canal, which leads on from here, um, but the lock was necessary to regulate the water because the canal companies were independent and they didn't want to lose water from one canal to another. You know, water was expensive to come by. You've got to build reservoirs, you've got to pump sometimes, and all this sort of thing. So um, um, there was this regulatory lock. And you'll see the building there, the Canal Side Cafe, you can see two bay windows. And one was the bay window for the toll keeper for the Birmingham Canal Company. And the far one was for the toll keeper of the Worcester and Birmingham Canal Company. And, um, and so, depending on which way you were going, you paid your toll. Um, when British Waterways, or the Docks and Inland Waterways Executive took over, both canals then became under the same ownership. And in 1961, they took the gates out because there was no need really to do this water regulation. And as a result of which, uh, now the levels are the same. There used to be a slight difference of about three or four inches between the two. Um, on the left here, some what were originally cottages, which now form one pub called the Tap and Spile. Um, the middle one used to be a pub called the Navigation. Um, and then later on became the home of the Beagle, or Beadle, I'll get him right, I'll get it right, for, and he was like the verger for the Church of the Messiah. The Church of the Messiah was actually built on top of the canal, and if you have a look at old photographs, um, when we go through the bridge, you'll see two brick walls on either side, and that was the continuation of this tunnel, and it was built specially because there was no space in Broad Street to build a church. And so about 1860s thereabouts, this church was built absolutely on top of the canal. So in a few moments, we would have actually, until about uh, 1975, we would have been going under the church. Hence, it was called Broad Street Tunnel. The Church of the Messiah, incidentally, was part, well, it was owned by the Unitarians, who were a sect. I, I think they were a, a monotheistic sect. I don't think they actually believed in Jesus Christ particularly, but it was just God. Um, now, <laughs> I don't know whether anybody's a Unitarian here. There's not many of them left, but anyway... Uh, they, they still have a, a presence and a small chapel up near Five Ways. But uh, anyway, they were able to keep the church going with a falling membership. And so, it, it, although it was a landmark, it was actually put, taken down. This has all utterly changed since the, um, the early 1980s. All there were were two high brick walls on either side. So we were going down a, a sort of something of a canyon, really. Um, but when it was decided to build the uh, International Convention Centre over here, the whole area was demolished and rebuilt with all these bars and restaurants and offices and whatever you see now. If you want to see a before and after picture, if you go on to Broad Street Bridge, there is, a, there is a, a, like a, a photograph or rather two photographs side by side. So you'll see the um, see as it was and as it is now. So it's, um, you get a pretty good idea of what it was like. All right, we're now beginning to swing left uh, on our 
uh, left is the, this grey sort of plastic building, the Sea Life Centre, um, designed by Norman Foster, famous architect. It's one of it's a bit like Marmite. You either like it or you don't, but it, it it's okay for what it what it is. On the right hand side, you'll see one of these canal arms going off. Not much of it left on the other side there. But that used to be the brewery arm. There was a brewery over here, and I'll talk more about that when we come back. On the right hand side, you see the Malt House pub. That looks like a 19th century pub, but actually is, is quite modern. So, um, built in the 1990s, early 90s. Building on the right, that is the uh, National Indoor Arena, the NIA. Now it's actually um, the Barclay Card Arena. In fact, actually, it might have even changed its name. It depends on who's sponsoring it. Um, and that, uh, again, is, is so utterly different from what was there before. There used to be a timber yard for, you know, for about 100 years. Right, now we, we're going off the main, what is now the Birmingham New Main Line Canal, onto the old main line. I explained that it was, owned, it was um, built between 16, 18, 1769 and 1771 by James Brindley, whom I'm sure you'll have all heard of at the public school. This is the original canal, which followed a very wandering course between Birmingham and Wolverhampton and had to be... Um, improved and altered to compete with the, well, the railways hadn't come, but they knew they were on their way. Um, the, the old canal di di just didn't have the capacity to be able to keep up with the amount of traffic which was, um, which, which was using it. And so they employed another engineer in the 1820s, Thomas Telford, or again, I'm sure you've heard of him, and he built, in effect, a bypass, a relief canal. And so he built it through the general course of the old canal. So what we have now are a series of loops. We've got the main canal going more or less straightish, and a series of loops on either side. Danny's showing you, I think she's got some literature so you can see what's what. Again, utterly changed in the last 30 years. There were coal wharves on the left-hand side and engineering works on the right-hand side here. But now, you know, uh, there was a gym here. Trendy housing on the right-hand side. So utterly different. On the left here, we've got the um, Crescent Theatre, uh, which is actually, as a, th a theatre company, has been going for about 100 years. Um, but it's changed venue several times, and this is its latest venue. And it fronts on to Sheepcote Street, which is the bridge that we're going to go under. It's an amateur theatre. Oh, yeah, very good, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah you're, those that have looked at the photographs will have seen how this... Um, how this, this branch, or this rather this loop, looked prior to development. We're beginning to swing round here. And in front of us, we see a large building called Sherborne Wharf. Um, that actually was a, a big warehouse built in the 1930s, or just before the war, for a, a very prominent firm of canal carriers, Fellows Morton and Clayton. Um, and then alongside it, um, there was the actual wharf, the open wharf, 
uh, which was used obviously for storing, well, receiving and, and sending out uh, materials and storage as well. Um, the warehouse was going to be actually bigger than it actually is. And in fact, you can see where the, the rather rugged edge of the, where the bricks are. Um, and that was where the, it was going to be extended, but it never happened uh, because the war intervened. And then there's this basin going off here. That actually is only, that's relatively modern. And in fact, the wharf used to run from the corner there over to the um, end of the white building you can see. The, uh, the white buildings there, the rather modest looking things which are, are about to be demolished, um, they were put in in the 1950s for the boat people because there were still family boats operated by British waterways right up until the end of the 1950s. Well, in fact, in fact even into the early 60s. Um, the boats only had little cabins on, so there were no uh, facilities on the boats apart from um, a bucket to uh, do your, the obvious in um, and uh, tin bowls to wash in and this sort of thing. So at least with that, they, when they were at the wharf, they could have a shower, they could use a proper flush toilet, um, they could wash their clothes and this sort of thing. A branch going off on the left there, um, only truncated now, was about three times as long as that. Again, uh, heavy, in well, say heavy industry, but industry on both sides here, um, now replaced with, uh, with flats and rather expensive ones at that. I get quite often asked, in fact, um, the crew generally, about the, the, how deep the canal is. Well, in fact, actually, it's not very deep. And um, there are sections when the, um, and particularly when we've had a, a, a summer like we've just had, when obviously low water levels, when you can hit the bottom. So you're talking about um, generally five foot in the middle and sort of training off depending on how the banks are. Some, sometimes the banks are like earth banks. Around here they're brick built, but they get, you get shallower to the side. So in other words, in cross section, you're looking at something like a saucer, and that's how the canal is. In some places, if you're trying to pass another boat, not so much around here, but if you're going beyond uh, in the southerly direction, where the canal is narrower and tree-lined, then passing can be, can be difficult. You know, and it's a question of passing as close as to the other boat as you can, otherwise you just get stuck. The narrow boats that used to use this canal, and this one is modelled on a commercial narrow boat. I mean, it's never been a commercial but narrow boat as such. Um, but on the other hand, if the if all the cabin work was taken off. Um, you could fill it with coal or gravel or anything you like. And um, you're talking about a carrying capacity of about 23 tonnes, something like that. 20 to 23 tonnes. Right, we're just about to go under St Vincent Street Bridge. Uh, when this was built, it was more or less the edge of Birmingham. Um, and it's called St. Vincent Street because it's named after Nelson's victory at Cape St. Vincent. So you get an idea, which is about 1800. So 1800, this was the, more or less the edge of Birmingham.
Now we're on the back on the new mainline canal now. This is uh, Telford's uh, new bypass, an improved canal, which is wider, of course, than the one we've just come off. And it was state of the art at the time, so it was um, it was like a dual carriageway, double towpath. Most canals only had one towpath, but this has two. And so you can have horses pulling boats in one direction and in the other direction without having to take the lines across or under the boat coming the other way. And that was considered to be quite an innovation at the time. Wide and deep, this canal's about six foot six in the middle um, and about uh, three foot six at the side. Uh, probably not quite as deep as it was it was an actual fact it, it was cleaned out um, by the well paid for by the city council about 30 years ago but it's still pretty deep even now it'll about another 20 years it'll need a, another going over so 50 years isn't bad for um, you know for, for, for a, a dredging operation on the right here where all these flats are these flats are relatively um, early as flats go dating from the 1970s rather than the 80s and 90s. Um, but they're built on a big railway marshalling yard <laughs> which served a, a flour mill at the, the end, which we've, uh, well, you won't, there's no, that was bombed during the war. And we're getting into this area of kind of semi-dereliction on the left-hand side. All these buildings are now disused and uh, will be pulled down in the next year or two. And so the whole area will be flats again. Well, I say again, but similar to what we've just seen. Another uh, bricked-up archway on the left-hand side. That's... Um, that used to lead into a basin. There were hundreds of basins uh, connecting with the canal. Every canal side company of any size had its own arm or basin, generally speaking, or at least a wharf alongside. Shortly after this canal was built, well, I'll say about shortly, about another 20 years, came the railways. Um, the London North Western Railway Company um, decided they would try and siphon off as much of the canal traffic as they could, and so they built their railway alongside the canal. And so just after passing through this bridge, you will actually see the, um, the railway on the right-hand side. Um, but Birmingham and the Black Country was still expanding rapidly, and so really there was enough traffic for both organisations, the Birmingham Canal Company and the London North Western Railway Company. However, eventually, the London North Western Railway Company thought, right, well, we've got more money than they have. Let's, let's buy out the, um, the Birmingham Canal Company. They did after a fashion. It was a, it's more of a, a kind of merger than anything else. Um, but it meant that then they could actually build canal transshipping basins. So the traffic that would otherwise go out of Birmingham and to the ports and various other places um, by canal would be taken just a matter of a mile or two to the nearest transshipping basin and then put on the railway. So the canal was still being used, but not quite in the way that it had been in the preceding 50 or 60 years. Right, we can see the railway on the right-hand side.
whole area is uh, beloved of our uh, graffiti friends. <laughs> so the, as soon as anything gets painted, then it gets painted over again and repainted, and so it goes on. On the left, you're, oh, you see a heron, incidentally. So it shows the water isn't as polluted as it used to be. They're quite tame. Well, I say tame. They're not frightened particularly. We also have kingfishers around here. Also grebes occasionally. They come in. Uh, great crested grebes and the little grebes, which are known as dab chicks as well. All right. And a minute or two will be taking a very sharp turn left on again onto the onto the old canal the old Brindley canal um, and we'll be going round what is now a loop and coming out past that junction we've just passed you'll also see the another loop going off on the right hand side and that goes past Winston Green prison amongst other things um, well, we haven't got time to do that unfortunately uh, but that's quite interesting. Um, but the funny thing is that it, we're going directly in the direction of Wolverhampton, um, probably straighter than the road, uh, the Wolverhampton Road w would be going. Um, but the original canal we cross is at right angles to the direction. So it shows how, you know, wandering it was. And the reason for that was because Brindley want to avoid major, avoid major engineering works, um, which of course cost money. And also his idea was, the longer the canal was, the more works and the more industries it would serve. So you've got a combination of factors there, but of course, since the canals at that time when he started, were only competing against roads which were in very poor condition, there was no need for speed particularly. Once the railways or once the, um, the industrial development really got going, then it was necessary to have a far more efficient and a faster means of getting from A to B. What is also interesting is you, as we're turning left here, if you have a look at the, the bridges, the bridges are really attractive. Um, this one was built in 1854. Most of them were built in 1826. Um, but they're all cast iron and beautifully done, almost like filigree, filigree work. If you look at the, at the handrail at the top, and you can see the little punched effect of the, um, the supports to the handrail. It was a little bit difficult to get round this turn when we have a westerly wind. At the moment, we haven't got very much of a wind, but normally the wind's blowing out this way. And of course, if it catches the boat side on, then you can quite easily hit the, the far side. All this area now completely, it's completely derelict. Um, well, it's a beyond derelict. It's actually now being developed, and you can see uh, you'll see diggers and various other plants and equipment, and they're preparing the site for one of the biggest housing developments in central Birmingham. Um, and in fact, when we come past um, again the Sea Life Centre, you'll see a boat, a wide boat, um, and that is a, a publicity boat for anybody that's thinking of being out of having the money anyway, uh, to buy a flat, uh, because this is going to be the place to live.
Oh, here we are. So, so uh, this will make a hole in your pocket money buying one of these, I can tell you. On the right, there is a factory which is still operational. I'm not quite sure what they do nowadays, but anyway, that apparently is the site of Matthew Bolton's Birmingham Soho Manufactory. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard of uh, James Watt. Well, James Watt um, formed an association with Matthew Bolton. James Watt was the steam engine builder. When I say steam engines, he didn't build steam locomotives. He actually built stationary engines. Um, and some of these are still around in museums, of course. Um, Matthew Bolton uh, was more of an entrepreneur, uh, and he set up this, this factory making all sorts of rather sort of... Um, well, they were known as toys, but they weren't toys for children. They made everything from musical boxes to watches to jewellery, all sorts of things. Um, and that remained, I, mean, I think it was on this site, nobody knows for absolutely for certain, until about um, 17, sorry, until about 1850. Right, we're just about to uh, cross under Ickneal Port Road, and then we'll do a left turn, uh, 180 degrees in effect. Um, but the first thing we'll see when we go to this bridge is a green bank in front of us. Um, and behind that green bank, there is about 50 foot of water. Um, that forms the earth dam for Rotten Park Reservoir. And that's one of the major canal feeders because, of course, canals have to get their water from somewhere um, for the Midlands, or for the Birmingham area, anyway. So, as I say, behind that earth wall, <coughs> there is an awful lot of water. And then in front of it, you'll, well, you can see the water coming out, that's coming from the reservoir now, because um, October, before, October's the, sort of the last blast of the, the cruising season, and so there are a lot of locks being worked, and locks, of course, cost water. So um, that's it coming in, and that will be running in day and night just to keep everything topped up. Right, on the right here, you'll see the Ickneal Port Wharf, and this is still used as a wharf by the Canal and River Trust. And you can see their workboats here. You'll see a rather interesting little cottage here, if you have a look, with Gothic-style windows. That was the Wharfinger's Cottage. <laughs> Still used by the Canal River Trust, incidentally, for officers. And then there's a range of buildings over on the, over on the far side, and they were things like um, uh, smithy, um, <coughs> uh, woodworking shop, all that type of thing. Now, these are the modern workboats that British Water, sorry, British Waterways, the Canal and River Trust use. The other ones here, this one, the Nansen II, is a tug, which, norm, which uh, did a combination of ice-breaking duties in the winter and towed strings of boats behind it, you know, during its working days. Um, behind that is a, a, a butty boat. Um, a butty boat is a unpowered boat that used to go behind a motorboat. A lot of um, canal trade was done in pairs, motorboat and butty. Obviously the motorboats only arrived on the scene when motors became a practical proposition. So you're talking from about the just before the First World War. Prior to that, it was all horse. So we've now done pretty well 180 degrees and we're now passing under the same, or about to pass under the same um, bridge, or same road as we passed before. So this is Ickneal Port Road.
an old coal wharf on the left hand side. There were dozens and dozens of these throughout the system. On the left here, we have the remains of a concrete building, which will shortly be demolished. And that was built in the 1920s by Birmingham City Council, and it housed a destructor. Basically, Birmingham City Council um, used to, uh, well, they used the canals um, intensively um, with a large fleet of horse-drawn boats which used to collect street waste from collection points, wharves along the canal, and then taken to these destructors where it was incinerated. Um, and the branch, you can see where the wharf was, where this concrete fence is. And there was also a branch which went off at right angles. You'll probably see evidence of it when you just get round the corner. Ah, no, it's, yeah, it's just been replaced with this brand new brick wall. <laughs> so now you see all the preliminary works for this um, development. As I say, it's one of the biggest in the central area of Birmingham. It was originally going to be, the development was going to start about uh, 10 to 15 years ago, but of course what happened was, is the, uh, of course there was a, the, all the planning processes have got to go through and then of course we had the financial crisis and that sort of knocked everything on the head. The big problem they have with redevelopment of these sort of sites is the fact that they've been heavily contaminated for about 200 years. So there's all manner of material that's actually gone into the subsoil, which they can't use. So they have to get rid of the subsoil, dig right down, sometimes up to a couple of meters, and then replace it with non-toxic material. And that's what they're doing now. That's why it costs so much to um, develop these sites. Where the, um, the digger is working now, um, this was a huge works. Um, it was Bellis and Morecambe's, and Bellis and Morecambe uh, made steam engines, but they made stationary steam engines, um, and they carried on until about the 18, until about sorry, um, the 19, probably up to about 1990, I would think, or certainly the late 80s. Um, by that time, they were making compressors and part of the Northern Engineering Group. Um, anyway, it was decided that they would shut the factory, and um, so you can still get Bellis and Morecambe compressors, but they're now made at Bedford instead of uh, Birmingham. Notice the, um, this sort of canvas arrangement. That actually is a dam. That's holding out the water from, the, um, from running into the works. I mean, they still have to have pumps. There's a bit of leakage.
quite a sharp turn here and we're back so we've done a complete loop now and we're back on the Birmingham new main line the one built by Telford and we've just come off the one built by James Brindley some 70 years before that well sorry 60 years before that With the redevelopment of uh, central Birmingham, the um, trip boating industry has somewhat boomed, and we now have something in the round about six or seven trip boats um, operating in the area. Um, but something which might be a bit surprising is that, in fact, there were, was a trip boat operating right back in the 1840s, um, and actually used to run from Tipton. Dudley and Tipton to Birmingham for Birmingham Market. Uh, and that ran for about 20 years until the railways obviously superseded it. And it was called the Euphrates Packet. Rather a um, highfalutin title for a boat. Um, but there is another company, not this company, but another company that actually operates a trip boat and they've called theirs the Euphrates Packet. And you'll probably see it. But, um, the old Euphrates packet was uh, somewhat cruder, uh, but nevertheless, I suppose for the time, um, you know, it was um, the sort of uh, standard of comfort you would have expected. On the left-hand side, you'll see another side arm that one's still open there's not many of them that are still open and that was a railway trans shipping basin i mentioned about the fact that the london northwestern railway merged with the birmingham canal company and this was a, a basin and when i first came here there were still the warehouses and the cranes to transfer goods from canal boats on, onto railway trucks and then um, for taken by locomotive to wherever. Notice that um, a lot of people are now using the towpath for um, running and cycling and walking their dogs and whatever. Um, obviously the towpaths were built for towage purposes. And the one thing you're not allowed to bring on the towpath nowadays is a horse. <laughs> sort of like 50 or 60 years ago, uh, the one thing you couldn't actually do was to bring anything else but a horse. <laughs> So things have changed completely. Well, obviously, there was a man involved in probably leading the horse, but that was as far as it could go. They, um, they weren't happy with cyclists, with walkers, runners, anything. Sustrans, which is the government-supported uh, cycling charity, um, have an actual fact put a lot of money, along with local authorities, uh, into... Um, in, 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 into, into actually resurfacing all the towpaths. Um, when I say all the towpaths, the towpath on the left-hand side is tarmac. Um, on the right-hand side is still more or less original. Whether, in fact, they're waiting for money to come and do that one as well, I'm not quite sure. But that's, 
if you have a look at the towpath on the right hand side, it's sort of a combination of mud and gravel. That's how they used to be. Notice that we're going through the right hand arch of the bridge. Uh, unlike the roads, the rule on the canal is keep right. Used to cause a little bit of confusion though because the Worcester and Birmingham Canal, which was the one that this one connects with, which we saw at the beginning of the trip, the rule there used to be keep left, uh, which is all right when um, boatmen knew what they were doing, but um, British Waterways, as then was, had to um, change the ruling for the Worcester and Birmingham Canal, otherwise there would have been uh, um, accidents. <coughs> <coughs> We're just coming steadily through the bridge here because um, there's a, the junction on the right hand side. That was the loop that we first came round when we started the trip. Obviously, boats can, can suddenly come out of that bridge hole. Now, instead of actually re retracing our steps round the, um, the loop that we came round, we're now continuing on the Birmingham New Main Line Canal, Telford's New Main Line, built incidentally in the mid-1820s. And we're just about to pass the roundhouse, just past the second boat on the left-hand side, uh, the roundhouse is the uh, one that has <coughs> been taken over jointly, seems, uh, by the National Trust and the Canal and River Trust. Canal and River Trust will have some offices there, but they haven't actually moved as yet. The building, which is quite unusual and grade two star listed, was built by, or was rather designed, by um, William Henry Ward. Birmingham architect, and it was um, won, his design won, as a result of a competition amongst architects. It was built between 17, uh, sorry, 1873 and 1875, and um, it's a complex of um, stables on the upper level, you can see where those windows are, um, and then on the lower level was the wharfage where materials were stacked, um, largely used for, um, for, for um, cat well, storing and distributing stone. Uh, you've got to remember that um, Birmingham, like most other cities, instead of having tarmac roads, they were covered in um, sets, in cobblestones. And there were sort of millions and millions of these cobblestones required. So they had to be brought in by canal. Some of them were brought in by rail and then, and then uh, brought in by road. But they were stacked in these alcoves. I mean, it wasn't only um, cobblestones. Obviously, there must have been sand, cement, and various other materials as well. The other building here, which is now the distillery, um, is a pub. I don't know whether they actually do any distilling there, but anyway, it's a pub. Uh, that actually was a, a school. Um, and there were a number of schools around here as a result of the 1879 um, Education Act, which was the first major Education Act um, of the Victorian era. Going under Sheepcote Street again, we went, that was the first bridge or first road bridge we went under after leaving Broad Street. Uh, 
ahead of us, directly ahead, you see that building covered in those um, steel circles. That's Birmingham's new library. A bit of a controversial building, but nevertheless, um, probably less so than the previous one, um, which was designed by John Maiden, the, uh, of the brutalist fame. Not that he was personally brutal, but um, his buildings were considered to be. On the right, we have these flats here, um, the Brindley Place area. Um, they occupy a site of a, a firm called Baxter's, who were the last firm to receive their coal by canal in um, 1972. And even then, it was still shoveled out of boats and barrowed into the furnaces. So uh, they were doing the, exactly the same sort of cargo handling in 1972 as they would have been in 1772. On the left, of course, we now see the NIA, or Barclay Card Arena, and the car parks of. Very popular for mooring here for um, visiting boats. Quite a safe mooring, generally speaking. You don't get much trouble from uh, vandals or people fooling around. On the left, a, uh, a giraffe made entirely of Lego, so I'm told. This is Birmingham's Lego Land Discovery Center, as you can read there. Very popular with the kiddies. Going another under one of Telford's bridges. You have a look at that. It says Horsley Ironworks, Staffordshire, 1827, which is the time when the canal was being built. Here we come to a, a crossroads. The canal on the right is the one that we went up when we started our trip. The one on the left leads to a flight of locks called Farmer's Bridge Locks, which takes, us, takes you down into the, past the Jewellery Quarter, uh, past the city centre, and ultimately out to the northeast via Tamworth. So you can get out to the River Trent, and um, well, if you have the right sort of boat, into the North Sea. You also see where it says Canal and River Trust, an island. Now that island doesn't serve any purpose, it's just merely there as a reminder of an island that used to be there, which was more into the junction. And the reason that island was put in was that during the war, there were gates that were uh, like lock gates uh, that swung from the island to the two sides of the canal. And then there was another set of gates that operated under the far bridge, which we, you, you'll have seen. And the reason for that was that had the Germans been able to bomb that section of canal without it being locked off, as it were, um, they would have penetrated one of the main tunnels into Birmingham New Street Station and paralysed the railway system. So um, that was the reason. And when it came to renew the island, they decided that um, they would... Um, it's, they could have just got rid of it altogether, but they decided to put another one in, just as a as well, in remembrance, really, basically. Passing the brewery arm again, and then passing. This is the publicity boat for the Port Loop development. That was the development we uh, we've just passed by. Notice that it's wider than this boat, so it won't go through any locks, but it will go through the bridges, or the local bridges here. Rather unusual paint design, but uh, I suppose uh, fairly unmissable.
Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're now coming to the more or less to the end of our trip. Hope I haven't bored you too much, but anyway, hopefully you. Oh, you're stopping at Gastric Basin. Sorry, oh, we haven't quite come to the end of our trip yet. Oh, you're going to the Canal House. All right, okay. Um, right, well, okay. Well, we're just going a bit further. As I explained, all the buildings, with the exception of one, are brand new. Well, I say brand new, within a 20 years. Uh, except the one on the left-hand side, which is the Brewmaster's House, which dates from the early 19th century, the Georgian style. Rather an attractive building, actually. You're not the best side from here, but you might get a glimpse of the frontage um, when you look backwards. The ICC here, International Convention Centre. Recently we had the Conservative Party conference here. Um, and the area was, was like Fort Knox. We had uh, police patrolling with submachine guns. We had marksmen on the roofs of the buildings. Somewhat disruptive for running the trips. We had to go through police checks and have sniffer dogs on board and all sorts. Right, we're now, as it were, entering the tunnel, but of course the tunnel is no longer here. So if this had been sort of 35 years ago, we'd be in the dark now. No lights. I'm passing under the church. Right, we're now going to go through the bar lock. This is not normally part of the trip, but nevertheless. Um, and you'll see how narrow the bar lock is. This boat is nominally seven feet wide, so probably slightly less. The bar lock's about seven foot six wide, so you've got about three inches on either side. So when the wind's blowing in the wrong direction, it can be quite tricky getting in here without actually clipping the masonry. The bridge here, although looks very old, in fact was built 1982. I think it's 1982, in the 1980s. Um, as a cast iron bridge, just to fit in with the others that we passed under. The large white building on the right hand side behind on, on the as which you'll see it says um, Bistro Pierre nineteen ninety four. This is now a restaurant. And where you see all those uh, bottles was in fact a canal tunnel that ran underneath the building and underneath the road. Right, we're now going to back up into the moorings. And you'll be able to uh, have a drink at the uh, canal house. I hope you've got plenty of money because it's bloody expensive there. <laughs> Has it? Oh, right. <laughs> Wonderful. 
It's something like about 5.50 a pint, I think. As a restaurant, incidentally, the Bistro Pierre is rather fine. It's, it is just a very nice restaurant. And not too expensive. Anyway, we're now almost there, so um, thank you very much, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you go. Cheers.